Once, the stars lived and died at our command. We were masters of space, time, and every other dimension. Our dominance was undisputed, but that all changed. Our ancestors succumbed to the weakness that lies in every one of us still, and in doing so, all but doomed our race. Now, as the darkness and fire of the Rana Dandra draws nigh, we must fight with greater ferocity, skill, and foresight than ever before. Upon our shoulders, our ancestors have placed a great burden indeed. But bear it we must, if we are to survive the tempests. Every Eldari must answer the call. Asuryani of the craft worlds, Harlequin players of the Laughing God, the growing death cult of the Inari, and the raiders and pirates upon the path of the outcast. With the gifts of our seers and the intelligence of our rangers, we must look to battles of the future. We must strike with the power of Kurnos's arrows, precisely where and when needed. We must let ourselves embrace the searing fury of Cain to shatter our foes. We must acknowledge that death, as never before, is a part of life, and may indeed even be our only path to survival. Finally, we must laugh at this bitter irony in the manner of Sigarak lest we fall deep into despair. The Eldari Once, the Eldari ruled the galaxy, and the long winding tale of their history reaches deeper into the past than even that time of might and splendor. The Eldari that dwell in the galaxy today are but fragments of that glorious former empire, and every one of them must accept the reality that its collapse was their own doing. The Eldari are largely a nomadic race, sailing the void aboard fleets of warships or upon massive vessels known as craft worlds. Others of their kind are based in the Webway, a labyrinthian series of pathways that exists between the material realm and the warp, part of both, but wholly in neither. Compared to many other races in the galaxy, the Eldari are vanishingly few in number. They are a dying race, set on a slow course to annihilation by the hubris of their ancestors many thousands of years ago. Once, the mere dreams of the Eldari overturned worlds and quenched suns. At their empire's height, the homeworlds of the Eldari were glittering paradises. Their powers were godlike, and their armies were nigh on undefeatable. This spread arrogance among many of the Eldari, which in turn led to cataclysm. A foresighted few warned of the impending doom and fled, but they were ignored by almost all of their kind. Though their long history has always been one of glories and sorrows, it is now the latter that dominate. Hope is a rare commodity among the peoples of the Eldari now. 
Some even see it as dangerous. For a hope that becomes false will hurt them more than a grim acceptance of a drawn-out doom. To fully understand the Eldari's plunge from Zenith to Nadir, one must first understand them as a species. Physically, Eldari resemble humans, but this comparison is one-dimensional to the point of uselessness. In their minds, physiology, and souls, they are truly alien. Eldari are taller than baseline humans, with longer, cleaner limbs. They have handsome, striking, and well-defined features, with skin as pale and unblemished as polished marble. For all the lightness of their appearance, they harbor a surprisingly supple strength. Their keen ears are pointed, and their slanted eyes possess a penetrating quality more like that of a hunting feline than a human being. All five of their senses are more finely honed, and as a result, they can experience ecstasies through music, food, perfumes, physical beauty, and touch that humans could never understand. Conversely, they can feel a level of revulsion in their experiences beyond that of many other races. This often lends them a haughty and pretentious manner, or at the very least, the appearance of it. One of the most fundamental and visible differences between an Eldari and a human is how they move. The Eldari radiate elegance and poise, and every move they make is laden with subtle intent. Indeed, gestures are as significant as spoken words in Eldari communication and etiquette. On the battlefield, they handle their weaponry with phenomenal grace and skill, and can turn a leisurely swing of the sword into a pinpoint, armor-piercing thrust in an instant. An Eldari's heart beats at twice the speed of a human's, and their minds race through processes, possibilities, and emotions so quickly and intensely that even the dullest of Eldari would be a once-in-a-century genius to mankind. Their organs and immune systems operate at a much higher level of efficiency and aging does not render them frail or senile. Provided they survive the many horrors of the galaxy, Eldari can live for millennia. And thanks to their hyperactive physiology and neurology, enjoy lives rich in sensation and wonder without threat of illness or disease. In addition to these myriad physical superiorities, all Eldari are psychic to an extent. It is said that the ancient Eldari could read thoughts with a glance, and that those training for war could crush a weapon with but a narrowing of the eyes. Such is the race's psychic potency that much of their technology is based upon psychic engineering. With matter being manipulated into the required forms using mental energies alone. They create force powered melee weapons that can only be activated by the psychic signature of their intended wielder, and ranged weapons 
that are triggered by psychic impulse rather than physical action. All of these great advantages come at a price. Though the exhilaration of battle, the intellectual rewards of study, and the rush of physical pursuits can inspire transcendent bliss for the Eldari, failure in an endeavor can cause them to experience soul-racking sorrow, doubt, and despair that would shatter the mind of a human. This deep contrast leads the Eldari to produce works of art, music, theater, literature, and poetry that are breathtaking in their beauty, but also in their darkness. This darkness, which lies in the soul of every Eldari, has the power to consume them should they let it. The scale of the pleasure that the Eldari can feel in so many different ways is a temptation that forever gnaws at each of them. To fully surrender to these desires is to invite destruction. The Eldari who did so millennia ago, seeking out ever deeper depravities, brought about the fall. The Fall of the Eldari The perfection of the Eldari was blighted by their pride. They saw their preeminence as being beyond all doubt, and believed the dominance they had secured over the galaxy was theirs by right. Nothing had posed a threat to the Eldari's existence since their time immemorial, and they believed they had nothing left to fear in the universe. They were fatally incorrect. At the peak of the Eldari's ancient power, nothing was beyond their reach, and no form of exploration or experimentation was forbidden. They asked only if they could, rather than if they should, and their confidence was total. They plied the stars at will, and immersed themselves in every wonder and sensation they could find. They created entire worlds dedicated to their pleasures. Such was their dominance that even stars lived and died at their whim. On thousands of paradisical worlds, the Eldari pursued their desires with no thought on their minds besides indulging their every wish, dream, and curiosity. By mastering the webway, their reach extended to the entire galaxy, and they learned much of the universe that has long been forgotten. Even when an Eldari died, after a millennia-long life, their spirits dissolved calmly back into the Aether for them later to be reborn thanks to the care of their gods. The warp did not thirst for their souls then as it does today. There were still wars in this time with young, upstart, inferior races. Most were incredibly short-lived, and the ease with which the Eldari crushed any opposition only reinforced their belief in their superiority. They knew in their hearts that they reigned supreme, and were convinced that nothing could topple them. The catalyst for the downfall of the Eldari came not from some alien invader, but from within their own collective psyche. 
their deep, insatiable need to fuel their passions and follow every wish to the extreme. With their society having long provided all the food and resources they needed, and far more besides, the Eldari could fill each waking moment of their long lives sating their every whim. Many totally surrendered to all their most hedonistic impulses, and exotic cults dedicated to countless kinds of sensual excess and esoteric knowledge sprang up across their domains. The older, nobler pursuits they cast aside as dull and overly restrictive. The Eldari found themselves always looking for more. They sought out every imaginable way to explore the full range of their emotions and senses. All was perilously decadent, to a level corrosive to their souls. The pleasure cults gained a hold over Eldari society, the acts of their members passing beyond the bounds of even extreme addiction. Millions were totally consumed by their darkest passions and fantasies, and Eldari culture slipped into anarchy. Some saw what was happening and fled, settling on remote worlds. These exodites reverted to more Puritan ways of life to stave off the spiritual decline the rest of their race was undergoing. Over time, the hideous lusts of the Eldari grew to such an extent that killers and depraved criminals began to stalk the shadows. Torture and murder became avaricious pursuits in their own right, and blood flowed in the streets. Hidden realms within the webway were turned over entirely to the pursuit of sadism and excess of every kind. Paradise worlds were twisted to the experiencing of the darkest sensations. Fearing impending danger, more Eldari fled. Many of them embarked upon the gigantic world vessels known as craft worlds. The Exodites and craft worlders were few in number, and were openly scorned and ridiculed by those of their kin who continued in their lives of depravity. With the Eldari's ceaseless experience of emotional highs and lows, echoes of their agony and ecstasy rippled through the parallel dimension of the warp. Here, thoughts and emotions flow together until they form conscious entities of greater or lesser potency, depending on the intensity of the feelings that create them. Thus, the corruption of the decadent Eldari became manifest on a horrifying scale. As the deluge of their raw emotion coalesced into a nascent god, that grew stronger all the time. Though they knew it not, the Eldari had created a sickening shadow of what they had become in real space, a manifestation of great nobility and pride, brought low by perversity and shamelessness. As the Eldari burned worlds and slew and laughed and feasted, the great enemy they had created stirred to wakefulness. It gorged on the dark fodder provided for it by the depravity of the Eldari's collective spirit, and 
became the most perverse and twisted creature ever to exist, the chaos god Slanesh. To this day, the Eldari refuse to speak its name, instead calling it Sai Lan Thresh, which translates to She Who Thirsts. When Slanesh burst into existence with a howl of raw power, every Eldari felt its talons tear at their soul. The god's birth caused a psychic implosion that tore at the fabric of the universe. The heart of the old Eldari empire was ripped out of existence entirely, leaving a pulsing afterbirth of pure chaos behind it. The epicenter of this apocalypse was a roiling wound in real space that expanded to encapsulate a huge swathe of the former Eldari Empire. A tumultuous warp storm that came to be known as the Eye of Terror. Until the emergence of the Great Rift, which the Eldari call Dathidian, the Eye of Terror was the largest area in the galaxy where real space and the warp overlap. This event killed billions of Eldari, as well as countless other beings, leaving their lifeless husks for thousands of light years around. Some Exodites were not far enough away to escape, and those craft worlds that had yet to cover enough distance were also destroyed. Slanesh consumed the spirits of the fallen Eldari as they were ripped from their bodies. As she who thirst inhaled these souls, it became more intoxicated. It wanted more. It wanted all of them. The Eldari had created their own nemesis, a chaos god that had developed an insatiable taste for their souls. Now, when they died, their spirits faced eternal torment, for Slanesh relished in toying with its prey and it would never rest until it had glutted its appetite in full. From this point onwards, the few surviving Eldari knew that they were doomed. Their race became fragmented into numerous untrusting factions. The focus of most became mere survival, in a galaxy where they had become the choice quarry of malevolent terrors, or obstacles to other races that had ascended in the power vacuum the Eldari had left behind. The galaxy now teems with countless other races, while the legions of the Dark Gods spill from the Great Rift. Yet, Despite all these dangers, the Eldari are determined that they will never be cowed by them. Craft Worlds Craft Worlds are marvels of grace and beauty. Colossal wraith-bone vessels, they sparkle like scattered jewels upon a pall of velvet as they drift in isolation in the vastness of the void. Distant from planets or the warmth of stars, their many domes gaze into the darkness of empty space, while their inner lights glisten like phosphorus through semi-transparent surfaces. Inhabited by those known as the Osirhani, the craft worlds are continent-sized 
interstellar fortresses, each one representing a small preserved fragment of Eldari civilization. The Asuryani see themselves as the guardians of their people's identity and strive to preserve even an echo of their race's past greatness without falling into the same pits of depravity that undid their ancestors. Considering themselves to be the true children of Asuryan, oldest and greatest of the ancient Eldari gods, the Asuryani pass their knowledge down through the generations with song, dance, and the recital of myths and parables. All craft worlds are self-sufficient, independent realms with their own culture, history, and traditions. Each maintains aspect warrior shrines in which the most proficient and the deadly fighters of the Osiryani train. They also harbor armadas of grav craft, hosts of spirit-driven constructs, and fleets of sleek warships. All await the day when the craft world must go to war. So few are the craft worlders that every citizen must be prepared for battle. Even the Asuryani citizenry hone their martial skill to fight as guardians if the need arises. These warriors serve as graf tank, war walker, and jet bike pilots, as well as infantry. Mounted like a stolen sun astern of every craft world is a shimmering webway gate. This portal allows the Asuryani to send their armies immeasurable distances across the stars. Even though craft worlds themselves avoid warp travel at almost all costs because of the danger it presents, Thus, the location of a craft world is little hindrance to its force's mobility, as it remains forever connected to the galaxy, even when hidden deep within the void. The Webway Gate is not a craft world's only mystical site, however. In the Great Halls of Forging, Bone singers and smiths of Vol use uncanny powers to craft beautiful, deadly weapons. Meanwhile, in each craft world's dome of crystal seers can be found a forest of glittering figures, each a mighty Eldari psyker in life and a crystalline statue in death. The most mystical of all structures on a craft world is its infinity circuit, a psychic power grid that runs through its wraithbone core, without which the world vessel could not function. Upon the death of their host bodies, Eldari souls are vulnerable to the predations of Slanesh and their primary means of sanctuary from this doom are spirit stones. These begin as waystones, precious psychoreactive crystals worn by living Asuryani that capture their wearer's soul at the moment of death. At this point, the waystone becomes a spirit stone and is then retrieved from the body of its wearer so that the essence within can be released into the infinity circuit. From here, the spirits of the fallen can still be engaged with by their kin. 
and so live on as ghostly echoes, safe from the horrors of the warp, in a twilight existence that allows them to watch over the living. Craft World War Hosts Guided by their far seers and autarchs, the Osiryani of a Craft World's war host turn their minds to war with a single purpose. Their individual strengths cohering into a single shimmering blade, hardened, focused, and brilliant. With frightening ease, they carve through their enemies with awe-inspiring grace, blistering speed, masterful skill, and merciless efficiency. The Autarchs are the Osiryani's strategic war leaders, and they tread the path of command. They are generals who have followed multiple aspects of the path of the warrior, a long and dangerous task, as well as spending time serving in their craft world's guardian militia. Autarchs frequently carry pieces of ritual war gear from the aspects they have studied with, which they receive in a ceremony called the Ron Lona, or the Covenant of War Gift. For example, an autarch may wear a banshee mask from the Howling Banshees, wield a heavy chainsword from the Striking Scorpions, and mount upon their back a warp jump generator from the Warp Spiders. On the long journey through the aspect shrines that these items reflect, the Autark gains a vast array of battlefield experiences that give them a deep understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of their war hosts. Each is a military mastermind, able to orchestrate their armies as a great maestro conducts a grand symphony. If one could say that the Autark is the Osiryani who wields a craft world's war host as a blade, then the Farseer could be said to be the guiding mind of the swordsman. Farseer's knowledge of arcane runes and the scrying of the threads of fate help inform where and when their craft world's hosts take to the field. Their prodigious psychic abilities also lend valuable battlefield support to the craft world's warriors, maximizing their natural skills and power. Osiryani armies have many unique components, just as there are many stages to crafting the perfect blade and countless ways to fight a duel. These elements all have immense value in their own right to the commanders of a war host. Regardless of the nature of a foe, the Asuryani have troops with skills suited to annihilating them. Yet, these components are at their most effective when they work in perfect concert, forming a well-honed machine much more powerful than its constituent parts. The heavy fire of Dark Reapers provides cover for infiltrating striking scorpions. Rangers snipe enemy officers just as they are about to warn allies of wave serpent transports delivering tank hunting fire dragons into the heart of an armored column. Swooping hawks soar over the battlefield, 
pinning in place those who would dare to outflank the Osiriani lines, buying time for warp spiders to materialize amidst the flankers and wipe them out. The Osiriani's ultimate goal in battle is to suffer no losses at all, for their numbers are few. The time between their generations is long, and their foes are many. They cannot afford to throw lives away needlessly. If they are to suffer deaths, then they should be losses that could not have been avoided to achieve victory, and should only be endured at great cost to the enemy. Guardian Hosts So few are the Osiriani that all are forced to train for war, in case they are needed to defend their craft world. A craft world's guardians are a militia whose purpose is to support the aspect warriors in war. In times of peace, they follow artistic and civil paths, but when called upon, they don their war masks and take to the field as infantry, artillery gunners, or vehicle crews. Guardians are well-trained and well-equipped troops who serve most craft worlds as a defense force. Such is their intelligence and physical capabilities and the high standard of Eldari weapons technology that guardians are easily as capable as professional soldiers of the lesser races. Though mobilized primarily in times of war, the more paranoid craft worlds, or those in more dangerous regions of space, keep a portion of their militia active at all times, periodically rotating those on duty. On some craft worlds, guardians are the most common of all their troops comfortably outnumbering the rarer aspect warriors. Most guardians serve as infantry in defender or storm squads. Those known as defenders typically go to war equipped with shuriken catapults, which when fired unleash a hail of monomolecular shuriken discs that can shred foes and pierce the heaviest armor. Fusillades of this razor-sharp ammunition are known to the Eldari as blade storms. Where defenders fight at range, storm squads fight at close quarters, and are armed with combat weapons or specialist close-ranged firearms such as flamers and fusion guns. Guardians also crew their craft world's Vol Wrath weapon platforms, capable of mounting a range of devastating and esoteric guns. These anti-grav artillery pieces provide invaluable supporting fire. Some crews are so skilled that they secrete their weapons in hidden locations and fire them using psychonic scanners rather than direct targeting matrices. Guardians crew the vast majority of the war machines of the Osiriani, which serve in armored fire support, reconnaissance, and transportation roles. Many of these vehicles are capable of such speeds and feats of maneuver that only Eldari have the reaction times to pilot them. War walkers 
operate forward or upon the flank of Osiriani armies. Their guardian pilots navigating harsh terrain with ease thanks to their vehicle's long legs. Armed with a pair of heavy weapons, war walkers are as hard-hitting as many battle tanks, and their advanced support systems aid them in selecting priority targets to pin in place or destroy. Once their forward mission is complete, they join the main battle, adding their formidable firepower to that of the main host. The Osiriani call these strikes the Sting of Grief. Referred to by the Osiriani as Engines of Vol, the Grav tanks crewed by Guardians include the Falcon, Night Spinner, Fire Prism, and Wave Serpent. All of these vehicles are triumphs of Wraithbone psycho-engineering that combine ethereal grace with terrible lethality. Powered by anti-gravitic technology vastly more sophisticated than that used by almost any other race in the galaxy, they can perform incredible acrobatics and violent swerves even while moving at high speed, and are capable of true flight for a short time. The Osiriani Path As protection against the lure of excess, and to guard against any recurrence of the fall, the people of the craft worlds adhere to a set of strictures known as the path. Through the rigid emotional discipline of the path, they master their inclination towards sensation-seeking. Instead, focusing their prodigious intellects and energies upon the pursuit of one specific goal at a time. Even millennia after the fall, the path is still needed, for at their core, the Eldari of the 41st millennium are little different from those who lived at the time of their race's collapse. Still prone to emotional extremes, the Asuriani greatly fear what would happen if such things were indulged. As a result, adult Asuriani devote themselves to the mastery of one discipline to the exclusion of all others. Each discipline is a path, and each might necessitate further choices and specializations. In doing this, they are able to harness a degree of emotional and intellectual intensity, their chosen path serving as a valve that allows a measure of experiential release while preventing such feelings from growing too strong. The concentration of efforts required on any path encompasses every element of the devotee's life. Though, once an Osiriani has walked a path long enough, they can choose another. Each provides experiences that nourish the Eldari's soul and aid them on future paths they might follow. There are countless disciplines to choose from, including music, poetry, literature, dance, agriculture, sciences, and all manner of artisanship, as well as those dedicated to mastering martial or psychic puissance. 
Each offers a complete way of life, and no Osiriani faces disrespect for choosing a less esoteric or arduous path. For all contribute to the craft world's culture and survival in a different way. Though safer than a life with no emotional restraint, following the path is not without dangers of its own. The Eldari mind is capable of a vast depth of feeling and understanding, far beyond mere human obsession, and can therefore fall prey to the many traps that await the unwary. An Asuryani can become so focused upon one aspect of their chosen discipline that they can no longer choose another. They become bound by the chains of their own compulsion and are said to be lost on the path. To the Asuryani, mental entrapment of this kind is a real and horrifying thing that can affect any one of them, regardless of the path they follow or their level of training. Aspect warriors who lose themselves on the path of the warrior become exarchs, individuals no longer able to disassociate from their killer selves. High priests of the war god Cain Exarchs are keepers of the bloody-handed god's shrines, and the teachers of his creed, and their abilities are far more developed than even those of the finely honed aspect warriors. Their lives are utterly dedicated to their aspect's particular way of war, and the teaching, training, and ceremony that go with it. Upon initiation, an Exart will don an elaborate version of Aspect Warrior armor, studded with waystones that contain the souls of their shrine's previous Exarchs. The wearer will assume the sacred name associated with this armor, and their own spirit mingles with those of the departed. So empowered, the Exarch can draw upon the skill, wisdom, and emotions of their predecessors, and any remaining sense of themselves as a distinct being is lost amidst the sorceration of the dead. It is a process that can never be reversed, and all who undergo it are held in both fear and awe by their kin. The Phoenix Lords were the very first of the Exarchs. Each founded one of the warrior shrines of the Asuriani, and is the embodiment of an aspect of Cain. Asurman was the first of their number and the tutor of all the other phoenix lords to follow him. They are immortal after a fashion, for when a phoenix lord is slain, another Eldari inherits their panoply of war and assumes their identity. Each phoenix lord's armor contains a spirit stone that holds a fragment of all those that have come before. Yet no matter how many individuals are incorporated, a phoenix lord's essence is forever the same. Their mind driven by the personality of the first incarnation. Over the millennia, each of the phoenix lords has disappeared for centuries or longer, before suddenly reappearing in times of great need. Yet. Since the coming of the Great Rift, all the Phoenix Lords have manifested, 
including several times when they all fought at the same battle. This exceptional event is known as the Gathering of Fire, or Conflux of Battle. The Osiriani can only speculate as to why these manifestations have occurred, though most believe they portend only great hardship and loss. Path of the Outcast The constraints imposed by a craft world life are such that some Osiriani cannot bear them and elect to leave the path entirely. This is a perilous choice. For lone Eldari are vulnerable to the predations of demons. Many leave their craft worlds to follow the path of the outcast, choosing the level of disassociation they wish to have with their former homes. Of these, the majority return to their craft world at some point or another bringing back alien treasures and tales of distant worlds. Some serve their craft world as rangers and shroud runners. In these roles, they seek out threats, investigate alien planets, search for lost webway gates, explore new found maiden worlds, and hunt down those who would harm the craft worlds. Sometimes, those who follow this path will also be sent to recover lost artifacts or retrieve the spirit stone from the corpse of a fallen warrior. Path of the Warrior Most Asuryani follow the call to war voluntarily at some point in their lives. This path has many branches, known as warrior aspects each reflecting a facet of the god Cain. These aspects have their own unique fighting techniques, weapons, battle garb, iconography, and battlefield roles. Though certain shrines are unique to specific craft worlds, most aspects are served by at least one shrine on each of the Osiriani's void ships. Some are even represented by scores of shrines on the same craft world. Aspect warriors hone their minds and bodies to perfection in their chosen shrines and fight with all the skills of a virtuoso. In battle, Warriors of different aspects weave their incredible abilities into a symphony of destruction greater than the sum of its parts, enabling them to overcome much more numerous foes with ease. Path of the Seer Known as the Witch Path, the Path of the Seer is the most dangerous and convoluted journey of all for all psychers are intimately connected to the warp. Those seers who progress too far along this path become far seers, and to them, leadership of a craft world falls, despite the Osiriani's fear of those trapped on a path. None can deny the far seer's unparalleled might, wisdom, and foresight, for it is these gifts that allow them to guide the fate of their people and craft world. Such responsibility is a heavy burden to bear, and one that many Osiriani would likely put aside if they had the chance. One side effect of the Farseer's metaphysical obsessions sees their physical forms eventually turn into delicate psychocrystal. When this transformation is almost complete, the sin-sent farseer makes a journey to their craft world's dome of crystal seers, 
joining their predecessors as an inert statue linked to the infinity circuit forever. <laughs>